Hi, everybody, and welcome. Let's get started. So thank you all for coming back. If you managed to jump into our intro call last month, that was just a bit of a chat with Jess and I about why these calls are a thing and what we're hoping to achieve. And so this month I have the honor of introducing our very first guest speaker. Now, Colleen McGuire is one of the wonderful women we have in Microsoft Australia. I was introduced to her through a contact that we both have in common and she couldn't jump in fast enough to support this initiative when she heard that we were putting these calls on. So I've had a sneak peek of her message and I'm super excited about some of the conversations that it will start. Um, so I'm just going to hand it over to Colleen so that we can get started. Colleen, tell us a little bit about yourself and your role at Microsoft and um, tell us about this leadership potential stuff. Awesome. Thank you, Sonia. Um, yeah, good morning. I don't know if it's good morning or afternoon, wherever you are, um, good whatever you need. Um, it's a real honour for me to just share some of my thoughts and ideas today. Um, so yeah, my name is Colleen McGuire. I have, um, I am a woman in tech. I started off in tech many, many years ago. I'll give away my age if I told you that I started off as a COBOL programmer in the late 80s. And um, yeah, always been passionate about technology. Moved away from that and spent a significant portion of my life around project and program management and landed up joining Microsoft um, in 2008 um, and have loved have loved every every year that I've been here. It's been amazing. Started off in services and uh, the last couple of years I've been working for our specialist sales um, unit um, managing teams across modern workplace. Um, my part-time job, when I when I find time, and and I do find quite a bit of time for, is leading women in tech for Australia. Um, I, it happened by chance. I put my hand up and I said, "Oh, what's this all this diversity stuff here? Yeah, I'm pretty keen. What can I do? What can I help?" And two months later, found my name on a slide, and I thought, "Oh my goodness, I have no idea what <laughs> what I need to do." So I was given the pillow of women in tech and I thought, OK. Um, and it's been an amazing journey purely because it's it's not a, I can't even say it's any kind of leadership role. It is just it's just been able to tap into incredible energy across so many females and males who are very passionate around driving diversity. Um, my passions are my husband does get nervous. He says, oh, are you are you going to turn into a, a woman's lover? Are you going to be an extremist? What are you? And I said, no, I'm just really passionate about helping people along their journey, no matter what where you come from. So my passion really is is diversity um, as, a, as a general. A um, couple of people I know on the call. Um, great to see your faces. And today I've just put together it really is my perspectives, my stories around um, leadership and things that have worked for me um, and things that I've figured out along the way. I'd love it to be an interactive session, so please, you know, jump in. I've asked Sonia to maybe um, make me pause and give some more examples if I'm rushing through a little bit too much. Um, yeah, so open, please ask questions as we go as I share my story. Now, Sonia, I was going to share my deck and I'm probably, I did upload it, but I didn't check the video. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So let me. Hopefully, this is the right way to do it. Colleen, it's Colleen, added it. Added it. So when you share, Hi. I'm good, thank you. So when you share, you need to make sure that you click on include uh, system audio, otherwise we can't hear the, vid uh, the sound on the videos. I've got no videos, but can you see and you can still hear me, right? Yep, that's perfect. Awesome, okay. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit around my philosophy around maximizing your leadership potential. 
Um, I am no expert. I am no author. Um, these are just things that I'm very passionate about and things that have worked for me um, along my journey. So I've already introduced myself. So thank you very much for having me today. So who am I? Right. And I often talk to this, especially with people in my team that I am managing or potentially even people who seek out for mentorship, right? And it's about developing a deep understanding of who you are. And it's taken me years to really get to a point where I truly understand who is authentically Colleen. And with that has come a lot of questioning. There's been a lot of actually things that I thought I wanted were actually maybe things that other people were and I felt that I had to be similar, right? And um, discovering who you are is very much around where, where your passions lie and what is authentically you. Now, I don't know how many people feel that they have reached that stage. But if you want to be an authentic leader, you need to be an authentic person yourself. And to be authentic, you have to understand who you are. Who, what are your passions? What are your drivers? What, what lights up the fire for you? Because every one of us are totally different. And when I say that, I know that I am totally different from even just my husband, right? We are motivated by incredibly different things. And it's been able to anchor on what is it for you, but also understand that not everybody is the same. So that's my first thing is around self-discovery. Who are you? What are your passions? What do you stand for? Where does your philosophy lie? Colleen, have you found that that has changed much over time, like maybe differing from the start of your career to now or as you've gone through different stages of life? Or are you finding that a lot of those principles in terms of your identity have stayed pretty universal? So I have found that I have always stayed authentically. OK, let, let me let me answer that in a couple of ways. Right? Sure. I think I've experimented with trying to be many different things. OK, yes. but who I am has never changed. There are times where in roles or situations you need to dig up a different persona to drive a, a particular result. And that's OK, right? As long as you are not living in that persona for too long, right? And, and I can say this in any situation. If you are in a friendship and you feel you feel like you need to live up to expectation, it's exhausting and it's draining. If you're in a relationship trying to be something that you're not, it's exhausting and draining. So it's it's about it's about finding finding what is authentically you and being comfortable with who you are. And there's been times in my life where I haven't been comfortable with that. I felt that there was pressure on me potentially. I am, and you'll see my next slide, I'm a, I've class, I classify myself as a gardener. Where I came up with that, I have no idea, and I'll tell you the story. But, um, you know, working for a company like Microsoft, especially in the 2000s, there was a perception that to work for Microsoft, you need to be a type personality. I am not a type personality. And I questioned whether, whether number one, am I the wrong fit for Microsoft? Or do I just need to change? And um, no, I don't need to change. And yes, I am the right fit for Microsoft. But it's taken me a while to actually be comfortable with that. I, I love that point because I think you're right. Not only a company like Microsoft, but our tech industry in general comes with so many stereotypes and perceptions of what we think a person looks like who is successful in that industry or in that particular role. And it ties in really nicely with the talk that I'm doing at Microsoft Ignite in Florida this year uh, that will also be recorded about being an introvert in this industry, which I know we have a lot of, but we've got introverts that have got uh, very public profiles and get on stages and speak to thousands of people as well. So it's lovely to, to actually address that point that the preconceived ideas or the stereotypes we have about oh, I've got to be this 
to work yes. for that company or I've, I've got to be this kind of person to do that role. Um, very often isn't the case when you talk to people who are actually successful in those places. Lovely. Well put, Sonia. Yeah. So I classify myself as a gardener. And um, I'm a proud gardener. And when I say, why do, I, why do I look at gardening? There's just so many things about gardening that actually resonate with me as a person, with me as a manager, with me as a peer. Um, and that is number one, um, you plan your garden, but you are patient and you let it grow and you tender to it and you nurture it and you feed it where it needs feeding. But you also understand that th certain things thrive in different areas. So if it's not thriving, you may move it, but you also may cull it and you may weed it out right um but the objective is the garden the garden that you want to create now i i, I am a i'm a patient person you know and i think it shows in my my history and years of project management is that you know i i don't need instant gratification in my job i don't need every day to feel like I've, i'm ringing a bell it's just not me i have patience i can nurture and i can grow so the now, not everybody's a gardener, right? That is just who I am. And I'm going to pause there for a little bit just to get a sense of, I mean, how many people could identify themselves with a gardener? But also, I'd love to hear perspectives of, well, what could you identify yourself as? Have you ever thought about it? So did the gardener label, was was that something that you thought of in terms of having a look how you operate or has this come from like a personality test or something? No, it was something I created myself. That's really great. I love how you've sort of integrated those aspects of, of how you work and how you live with something like this. Yeah. Oh, Susan. Susan's an archaeologist. She digs for information. I love it. And look, oh, I am... I am not the kind of person who digs for a lot of detail. So we need people like you, Suzanne, in the world. And I love that, you know, in communities like this, we do find people who are different than, than we are and have different skills. Because when we can bring all of those powers together, we make a really strong community. Absolutely. I love the archaeologist. That's a, that's a really good one. That's so I think my point here is that every everybody everybody is going to identify with something and what helped me define my gardener was actually my personal philosophy and the story along my personal philosophy is for those who i don't know how many people are at microsoft um in this call but we had a um a training that was that was released a couple of years ago called the high performance um, mindset and part of that high performance, we did it as uh, our leadership team did it. And um, our director was pretty keen on knowing what people's personal philosophies were. And because part of the, the course was to develop your personal philosophy. And I struggled with my personal philosophy. And I remember sitting in Vegas with two of my colleagues and they sort of had crystallized their personal philosophy. It was very much around winning. Um, it was, they were both fairly, uh, you know, bringing out competitive streaks. And I just thought, I just couldn't find one because I'm not competitive. I'm, I'm probably very tough on myself and I have very high expectations of myself, which propels me to succeed. But I'm not competitive in terms of I want to beat somebody or I want to win. And I sat on the bus between sessions at Ready two years ago. And I was feeling pretty low around, well, actually, what is it, Colleen? And how, how do you belong? How do you anchor? How do you anchor into a sales organization, right, when you can't even anchor on that sort of driving results and driving an outcome? And funny enough, uh, there's a lot of things that have come together because it's actually not about driving results, it's about driving success. And they are very, they're two very different things. Success is something that you can feel, whereas a result is something you could potentially tick off. 
And um, it's definitely the success that I want to drive. But my personal philosophy landed up being um, to nurture every moment into a lifetime of memories that I'm proud of. And that is where my garden story came in. Because when I look at I am a nurturer, I like to build things, but I like to build teams. I like to build connections. Um, and that's really where my strength is. And that is where I am happiest. So on personal philosophies, I don't know how many people have actually spent time on a personal philosophy. I would definitely go and invest some time in building a personal philosophy. Just a sentence, try and keep it as short as possible. If you can't remember, it's pro if you can't remember your personal philosophy, it's probably not the right personal philosophy because when you find the right one, you will never forget it because it just is so crisp around what you stand for and what you strive for. And your personal philosophy doesn't necessarily have to be work related. Mine, I feel, is really well balanced between being um, a parent um, and a mother to two daughters. It, it really works well for me being a wife, a sister, um, a daughter, and somebody in the workplace. It, it works for every aspect of, of my life. Um, so pausing, anybody, anybody ever built a personal philosophy or if you have one, would you like to share? You're a very quiet crowd. You're making me do all the work today. Look, it's something I've no, never actually thought of. Yeah. But it, it's interesting because we have one of these things in our home. We have one of those in our house boards that says, you know, in, in our house we do this and we do that and, and, and we do the other. So, you know, as a family unit, we have some sort of guidelines as to, to what we think is important. But I don't think I've ever looked at it on a personal level and definitely not to the point where it's such a succinct statement like that. But I, I love how broad a fit that is for all the different areas of your life. Yeah. So one of the reasons why I think it is so important is because it connects you to be your authentic self all the time, right? Because often where you lose your way in leadership is when you're trying to when when you get lost in trying to be something that you're not that you're not authentically yourself, right? So when times under stress, when you know when times get troubled or whatever, it's it's easy to lose your way. Um, in leadership because you there will be times where you are where you have to make some some tough decisions right there will be times where you are navigating through extreme pressure and if you can't anchor to your authentic self in every situation um, you're going to walk away from it incredibly drained and really tired and probably not feeling that great about it and I'll give you an example of, so I have recently, I've recently changed my role. My previous team was Modern Workplace um, Technical Specialists, and uh, that included the Collaboration Technical Specialists, the Modern Desktop, and the Surface Technical Specialists. And with our most recent blueprint, my whole team um, lost their roles. And some of them were remapped and some of them weren't. And, you know, when, when you look at being able to lead a team through um, some really troubled times, um, you don't have all the answers. Um, some people, the future's looking good. Some people, the future's not looking that good. And um, the only way you can really lead a team through that is by being number one, I think, you know, obviously connecting to the reason why, right? We can't show up over emotional. Um, we have to be very clear on why the company is doing this. But bring the empathy, right, with you. So being able to be empathetic, be able to be understanding, but also be able to, to stand firm with the company direction and the company's um, strategic objectives um, and be able to blend those two together it's not it's not easy 
Now, if you're putting yourself, if you are compromising yourself in that situation, you cannot do what's best for your team. You will be unable to navigate through, or you can, but you will find it extremely challenging. So moving on, I'm not just that. I am also, these are my two daughters, um, and this is my husband, so I am a wife, I am a mother. I am a sister, I have three sisters. Um, these are my best friends from school, so I am friends. These are some of my colleagues from Microsoft. I'm also an aunt, I'm a daughter. Um, and these are also colleagues. I'm a peer and I'm a manager. I mean, there are many, many, many things that I am, right? And those are just different ways of how people connect to me as a person. But I think the message that I wanted to say is I still am Colleen. Whether I'm a mother or whether I am a wife or whether I am a peer or a manager at work, I am still always Colleen and I'm still anchor to the same philosophy and the same values and the same passions, no matter where I show up. So moving away from me and really looking at, well, how do you, how do you, anchor yourself authentically to yourself. There's a couple of other things that I wanted to pull together that I'm really passionate about for myself and for my team. The first one is the fixed mindset versus the growth mindset, right? Um, I think it's everybody, I think, has seen these, right? But these, these are the kind of behaviours that can either create a uh, will create the environment for a team or individuals to thrive or to fail, right? And when you look at the fixed mindset, it's incredibly easy to fall into that. I find myself still falling into it. I think I said it to the, other, the other day, I am so irritated, I'm so frustrated, I don't know why I'm doing this, I might as well just give up, right? It's hard Okay, it's hard to stay constantly in the, the, the growth mindset. So I think the challenge really is to say, well, when you, you know, how are you checking yourself in? Are you checking yourself in to say, okay, where am I? Where am I today? I don't like being challenged. Okay, identify that feeling. Whoa, that's fixed mindset, Colleen. Let's shift. Okay, how can I show up better? That's not going to get me any further, right? I heard a great saying the other day is that when you get stuck in your drama, right, you you cripple yourself from being able to move forwards. As soon as you take the first step forwards, okay, it's the first step of a journey, right? Every journey starts with a first step. Okay, so not only for yourself, but also for your team. Now, it's easier to keep yourself in check. It's a lot harder to keep your team in check because you don't want to go to your team and say, oh, you've got a fixed mindset, right? That's not the kind of message we want to land with our team. So it's about coaching and encouraging around, well, why do you feel like that? Why don't you see this as a challenge that can potentially help you grow rather than a challenge that's just creating extra work for you, right? So it's these things that, you know, that you have to constantly keep yourself in check and coach your team through. Now, I know we can all identify with fixed mindsets and growth mindsets. We love to think that we're always all on the growth mindset. The reality is, is every single day there's something going through our minds that is fixed mindset, right? The best you can do is identify it, keep yourself in check and go, no, that's not great behavior, Colleen. Let's move on. Questions around this one, yeah. yeah, this one, this one in particular. I recently had a uh, experience with my teenage daughter, who has only just turned fourteen, and it's kind of hammered home to me how important it is to be real about this stuff. She got very upset because she was finding a piece of homework particularly hard, and she felt nervous about asking for help. And as a parent, that kind of breaks your heart because you want your kids mm -hmm. to come to you and ask for help. But she is such a confident, capable, smart, talented girl that most of her academic work comes easily to her. And 
she feels like she's letting people down, like she's breaking this persona that she has publicly, that she's got everything under control if she's struggling with something. And it really was a teaching moment for me. You know, kids are great at teaching parents stuff, I tell you, um, to make sure that I'm being open and honest in front of her when I'm struggling with something or I'm learning something new. And I said to her, look, 14-year-olds aren't expected to know everything in life. And guess what? 42-year-olds aren't either. I've done the most technical learning in my role in the last 12 months and I've done it a long time. I'm constantly asking questions. And that's also challenging when you work in a team of rock stars, which is what I call my colleagues, because honestly, they are the people that get up on stage and make this look easy. And I go, how am I supposed to live up to that, right? But the more I get to work with them on a day-to-day basis and the more we build the trust relationships in our team, the more we realize that, hang on a minute, it took me like two weeks to put that demo together because of some of the challenges that I came across and some of the new things I had to learn. So everybody, you know, has the stuff to learn and the stuff that they have to get over. It doesn't really come naturally to anybody, despite how easy it looks on the outside. So it really was a bit of a moment about, you know, making sure that that we are being open and honest that when we're failing or when, when we're learning and when, when we're going through stuff and not just sharing the shiny results of the after. No, absolutely, Sonia. And, you know, it's, um, so you hit on a couple of things there for me. I think the one thing is that there's one thing about being reflective and then looking for opportunities to grow. And the other one is, is being self-critical, right? And I think it's finding the balance between, okay, I'm learning something, yeah, okay, let, let me give myself a little bit of leeway, right? And it's okay to learn something new rather than expect yourself to always know everything. Um, and I think we often, I think as, as women, we often expect ourselves to be, you, you know, to be perfect at what we do, right? Um, and to be expert. So we are, you know, with doing that, we are, we limiting our potential, right? We're limiting our potential to grow um, into, or grow our skills and grow our experiences. But the other thing that you tapped into, so I was asked to do a, um, it was, it was Deliver Success and it was a session at our leadership conference a couple of weeks ago. And I was asked to co-present with Eric Swift, who is one of our directors. And I was I was pretty nervous. I was. I was pretty nervous, right? And I thought, oh, you know, he's such a fluent speaker. It's in front of, you know, Steve Worrell and all our execs. And I thought, whoa. Oh. I just thought, well, oh, what happens if I, you know, if it doesn't land well? And um, I did it. And Ingrid, our HR director, came up to us and she said, Colleen, that was amazing. She said it was just you. And that's when I suddenly realized that I wasn't asked to present because of my presentation skills. I was asked to present because of me. And it brought something different and it brought a different perspective. And I think that's one thing I need to constantly remind myself is that Just being me does have something, right? Because we're all different. We all have a different perspective. We all have a different story to tell. So it's not about benchmarking. If you're a rock star, you know, you all have to know, you know, X amount of depth and your technical intensity. And it's, yes, those those, those, those things that are your trade and your skill are absolutely important. But it's, but it's the things that make you uniquely you, right? And having the right, and, and that's this is where the growth mindset comes in as well, is it's just the right attitude, right? Just how you show up around, you know, if you think of people you want to interact with, if somebody's always saying, oh, well, don't do it that way, and oh, you know, it's always half full, and they're not great people to be around. They drain your energy, right? So, Think of the mindset. Um, it really is a way to keep yourself in check, right? And it's a great way to coach others into really being um, open 
um, look for new challenges and develop and grow. That's awesome. Sonia, I know you and I have done a lot of talking. Anybody else want to jump in and share an experience? Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah, I'll leave the questions in for last. OK, the next um, thing that's really important for me in terms of success is time. So we all there's one thing that we all have in common, and that's the same amount of time. We all have the same amount of time, right? It's something we can't buy more of and we can't really get less of. Time is time, right? So one of my learnings through my life has been how do I optimize my time to best suit myself and what is important to me? And as I've as I've got a little bit older, I think, you know, with some maturity, you do stop worrying less about other people's agendas and you be, do become a little bit more focused around what are the things that are important to you. Now, I'm not going to share the, the video, but I will share the link. It is in the deck. Um, it's got some really crude language in it, but it's a video of about 20 minute video um, about um, the magic of not giving an F. And in summary, the story goes around a she shares a story around um, being very unhappy where she was in her job and decided to pack it all in. Um, and really stop doing all the things that she didn't feel like doing, right? And she said, it's a little bit like having a F budget, right? So you've got a budget of time. There's only so much that you can do with that time. And you need to make, you need to make those decisions around where you want to use that time most effectively because you only have so much. You can't create more. It's not going to happen. And once you've got, once you can prioritise your time, the biggest challenge with prioritising time is being able to turn around and say, those are the things that I'm not going to do. Because we have a compelling um, need to satisfy and please others, right? And I think us ladies um, have got a, a, a bigger chunk of that in us than, than some of our counterparts, right? Where we, we, we feel that it's a, that we often feel there's a duty. There's a duty to do things um, that potentially we don't want to do or we have no interest in doing. Mm -hmm. And if you watch the video, the beauty of the way she tells the story is around just being nice when you say no. And saying no is okay. Um, she uses the analogy of going to an office party, a farewell of somebody that you don't particularly get on, but you feel that, oh, you should be there, so you say yes, and then you procrastinate for four days preceding the event around, oh, I really don't want to go, I really don't want to go, how am I going to get out of it, how am I going to get out of it, and then probably half an hour before the event, and I have done this many times in my life, um, you make an excuse and you say, oh, you're not feeling well, or you do something like that, right? And you try and get out of it. That's not a nice way of saying no. And then you should feel guilty. Now, you should feel guilty about leaning down because you made a commitment, right? And you you indicated, yes, that you were going to invest this time. You, you made a commitment to somebody. So the trick is how do you say no and be okay about it and actually say no nicely, right? And it takes a lot of practice and I'm nowhere near it. I'll, I'll say that this is probably still something I have an incredible journey still to get through, right? Um, but if you, there's certain things that in your life that is going to be a must, right? Okay, if you want a great set of teeth, you're going to have to brush your teeth, you're going to have to brush your teeth, right? There's certain things in your job that are a must, right? Um, for you to be successful and also for, for you to show up um, as, a, as a contributor towards the organisational success, right? But this is then, there's still a lot of time that you have outside of those things that are have to do's, right? So when you say no, you just say no nicely. Thank you very much, but um, um, I won't be joining you. 
And if somebody says, why not? You could say, well, I be I prefer to be spending that time with my children on a Thursday evening. Or, you know, I've got a book that I would like to finish. And, and that's it, right? Um, I know we all feel guilty about saying no. We feel like if somebody asks us to do things, something, we, we either need a really good valid excuse. Why? But it's something we're going to have to learn to do. My husband does it so well. And I still haven't learned from him. He will just say, no thanks. And that's it. No thanks. The next one is holding people accountable. This has been something that I've used for many years. And if you can't hold other people accountable and they don't know that they've been held, held accountable, they will let you down. Okay. So a critical thing in leadership is being very specific around your expectation, right? And holding that person accountable. We tend to do this a lot better in our personal lives than we do in our business lives, right? We tend to have a very open um, with with our partners. Um, if you are in some kind of relationship, generally you have, and Sonia, you, you spoke to sort of a frame that you use with your children around, well, these are the things that we commit to. These are the things that we subscribe to. And when you, when you are in a relationship, you generally have a common understanding of what are the boundaries and what are you holding each other accountable for. Often in business, um, we are holding people accountable, but a lot of it is unspoken and not necessarily um, um, unknown. Right? So we have expectations of people, but they don't really know what that expectation is. So one of the things that I do is I'm very clear around expectations. And even though as clear as you can be in expectations, there's always going to be something that is just you didn't know you wanted it until you didn't get it, right? And that's okay because that's how humans work. But holding people accountable, being able to go very simply, hey, Sonia, are you good? Um, to present next week, Wednesday. I'll check in with you on Tuesday, um, but can you have it done? And Sonia asked me to present this, and I did leave it for the last minute, I admit it. Um, that was my choice, um, so there's no guilt, but I made a commitment and I will follow through. But she held me accountable. Um, it was in my diary, it was communicated, She'd phoned me, we'd had the discussion. She was very clear in terms of what she was expecting me to do. So I need to show up. And if I hadn't sh shown up, right, it's absolutely in Sonia's um, remit to be able to say, actually, Colleen, you let us down. Um, you know, I'll find somebody else, but you, you have let us down. I'm going to have to reschedule. Or, but so all I'm saying is don't feel shy or don't shy away from actually maybe calling people out where they don't meet your expectation, right? Does it resonate with anybody? So the thing that so I find tricky, tricky with that is mm -hmm. I'm actually one of the people, people who will who meet the deadline, the deadline and will will to the things, things that I've said that I'll do. Well. And my kind of conflict comes when I'm dealing with other people who don't quite have that same sort of drive who kind of see these deadlines as being optional <laughs> and um, how do you deal with that when you've got people that you are relying on that don't quite put as much of an importance as uh, coming through on those things as you do? So Sonia, I, I don't know whether it's fortunate or unfortunate. My background is project management, right? <laughs> So it, it, it's something that I've always done, right? So when, you, when you're looking at, okay, so these are the things that need to be done. Okay, so I'll use you as an example. So Sonia, you're going to do X, Y, and Z. Um, will you have it, you know, can you have it done by this date, right? So always ask for a date. Always ask, do you need help? Is there anything that's going to stop you from doing that? Because Sonia, if you ask those few simple questions, right, and that person cannot deliver to you, I think absolutely you can call them out, right? 
I would be in the position as a project manager. I would say, well, Sonia, actually, hang on, because now why did I need you next time? I might give you leeway the first time, but next time, can you give me a heads up? Because I've got three people who are dependent on that on that activity being completed, right? Or we have a customer that, you know, that we said we would respond at a certain date and we are unable to respond. There's always a consequence, right, of people saying they will do do something and then they don't, right? So I think it's I think part of it is that we don't when it when it doesn't happen, we don't bring it up. We shy away from it. Right? People will only let you down a few times. And then there's also the times where you're going to go, well, actually, you were late three times in a row. I'm not sure, right? I've had, I, I've got an old friend of mine that when we meet up is always late. So I say to her, well, how late are you going to be? Because I don't want to sit there for an hour and a half on my own, right? Then you pick me up and I'll make an alternative arrangement with them is to say, well, you pick me up. I'm not going to wait. In a, in a public place, feeling uncomfortable all on my own. Call it out. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's also important because a lot of us have that natural tendency to do whatever it takes to meet those expectations that we've set, to know that it's also okay to push back with early warning when things are going to slip. I had a situation at work where um, I had some downtime and then I had a period of travel and some things slipped from other people. And so the work that I was going to do, all of a sudden I got this email saying, you know, we need this within the next three days. And I pushed back and I said, I'm not going to be able to do that. This is what I've got on my plate at the moment. And I'm very sorry, but that's not a realistic deadline for you to give me three days notice. So I think that there is a flip side to that for us as well to be able to say if if you have people that are imposing deadlines on you that that aren't realistic and you know up front or you have something else come up in your world, sometimes it's a case of that's fine, but I'm also working on this, this and this you know, what do you think needs to be the priority here? Because I've learned through experience that I'm personally really good at saying that I can do something based on whether I'm capable of doing it, not whether I've actually got the capacity to do it. Um, and it's a really good recipe for burnout when you start to committing to too many things because you know that you're capable of doing them and you kind of forget that you only have so many hours in a day and a whole bunch of other stuff you've said yes to as well. So it's, yeah, it, it's also important to communicate yeah. with other people when you're not going to be able to meet those deadlines and just go, look, this is what's going on. Yeah. yeah. And um, I suppose that goes back to your time, right? How are you using your time? Sure. So, yeah. Okay, I'm going to move move on. Um, I've got two more, right? The next one is stop comparing, right? This took me a while, and and I'm I'm going to share on a couple of levels around stop comparing. I mean, I us women can walk into a room and we go, oh, no, I'm underdressed or, oh, you know, my, my shoes on, on aren't as nice as that person's or, you know, I'm the only woman in, in the room or always comparing, right? And um, I think there's a time where you actually just have to say stop, just stop. You are who you are. Be proud of who you are. Don't compare yourself to anybody. You have something that is beautifully unique, right? So when you go in, you should be looking at yourself as something unique, not something that you're not. And often when we compare ourselves, we often start creating, I'm not this, I'm not that, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, right? And it creates a negative around all. And that's where I think where a lot of the imposter syndrome comes in, is because you are comparing yourself. And just like Sonia, you said, you know, you work with some rock, you know, rock stars and rocket scientists and where I can guarantee you, you have got talents that um, supersede some of their, you know, their rock star brain, brain science, whatever they've got, right? Um, so, yeah, just stop. Just, if you can, just stop comparing. And if you feel like you're doing it, okay, reach out to somebody and just go, why am I doing this? Because you know what? 
you they they you will be ten times more critical on yourself than everybody else. And if somebody is critical, right? If it's not constructive, don't listen to it. If it's constructive credit feedback, great. You're going to learn something out of it, right? We all want to learn. But if it's not, just ignore it and carry on. So stop comparing. Okay, and then the last thing that I've got for today is my philosophy for success has been pick up a ball and run with it. You'll be surprised how many people will run after you and join in the game. And it's a little bit like if you look at a bunch of kids, right? As soon as one kid picks up a ball and starts kicking it in the playground, the kids flock and they all start playing. It's incredible um, how people will actually join you on your journey. Um, but you need to have a vision. You need to have the right mindset. You need to bring in energy and passion into what you're doing and people will naturally follow you. Don't be concerned if the ball you picked up is the wrong ball, right? You can switch it. So don't be scared. Don't wait for, you know, is this the perfect ball to pick up? Just pick it up and run with it. Pick up an idea and socialize it. You'll be surprised what people are prepared to follow you for, right? And I'm going to stop there. So I finished a little early, but I don't know whether there's questions or I'm going to open up to everybody. I have a question. Thanks for the presentation, Colleen. Uh, so well, what's next for you? Because, in my career? Uh, yeah, because, you know, as a someone that uh, at your level, so I would like to hear your opinion around how you see or how you approach the next level for you or what's next for you. So that's a tough one as and it's probably because I. Um, I love leading teams and leading people, but. I sometimes wonder whether I really want to be as ambitious in some of the roles in Microsoft. I'm, I'm going to be very transparent, right? Um, I don't see a, I don't see my path going into sort of like a director SLT level. Um, it's not the kind of game that I see myself playing. Um, which sometimes I do sit and think, well, then what is next for me? Um, I think what's next for me is I would love to get more into um, probably coaching teams, right? Not individuals, but coaching teams. Um, looking at how driving culture is something that I'm very passionate about. Um, but I'm not quite sure what the job looks like. I know the things that I'm interested in but I'm not quite sure of what that job looks like. And I don't worry about it too much. And the reason why is because when you are doing things that you are really passionate about, right, people notice because you, you will have a spark to you. You will have energy to you. People around you will notice. And those, those, those opportunities will actually come to you. You just have to, you have to be bold and you have to get out. And that's why I finished off on pick a ball up and run with it, right? If you want to be a leader, be a leader, right? Don't sit on the back of the bus. Pick up something and lead it and people will follow you. That's what leaders are about. It's not about the management position. It's about being a leader. Um, and once, and if you're going to do that, people will recognize, people will notice, people will talk about it, right? And those then management and leadership positions will come to you. That's my philosophy. It's always worked for me. I, I love that philosophy and it kind of echoes how I ended up with my job at Microsoft. And so being an independent sort of freelance consultant and sharing with technical communities about the things that I was working on, I was quite active in user groups and on Twitter and with blogging. And honestly, I had somebody tap me on the shoulder who was interviewing for this team at Microsoft and said, would you ever think of coming to join the company? Would you like to see the job description? 
And one, I just about fell over when I saw the job description, but Microsoft had always been one of those things sort of on my bucket list that, yeah, it would be amazing to get a blue badge one day, but I wasn't actively searching the careers website to find the perfect role for me. And when I did my first interview, with someone that I didn't know at Microsoft, they said, oh yeah, like there are a whole bunch of people here in Redmond who know who you are. And I'm like, I hope that's a good thing. And they're like, it's totally a good thing. So it's really, it really echoes what you're saying about getting out there and doing the things that you love, that you love and that you're passionate about. And it, it's amazing to see where that takes you and, and who notices and, and what lies ahead in your career that you would never have even thought of. Thanks for sharing your uh, your feedback. Can I ask another question? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, because this is something that I struggle a lot. And when do you give up? Because sometimes, you know, you assign a task. And instead of, you know, going through that path, so you, if, when you, you know, start saying, oh, it's not possible, so you might start to find a workaround. But if you don't know when to give up, it's getting harder and harder because you go deeper and deeper into something that it might not have a good result. So, so as it depends on how you look at it, right? You might give up on a task, but your ultimate goal is still your goal, right? Yep. And I don't think that's giving up. I think that's, okay, well, that didn't work. Let me pick up something else, right? Because there's multiple ways to get to an outcome, right? So I think that the big thing is, are you giving up on your goal or are you giving up on the task? If you're giving up on your goal, then I would say, well, are you shifting that or shaping that into something slightly different? That's not giving up. But giving up on a task because it's not working and it's not getting you to your outcome, I think is perfect. It's not giving up. It's about saying that's not working, okay, but this could work, so let me try that. Yeah, so I think that personally I have a problem in terms of I don't know where should I stop and where, where should I sit back and look look at the problem again and find a workaround. Because my mind says oh, if you stop doing it, it means that you're giving up. But what, what you pointed out, it's correct because I, you, the end result is delivering the goal. It's not doing that specific task. Exactly. So don't worry about it. If something's not working, it's like a little gadget. That one doesn't work, chuck it. Pick up something else. It's not giving up. As long as you still got your eye on your outcome and your goal, I think if you give up on your goal, right, of something that's really important, that's giving up. Thank you. You're welcome. So Anybody from the chat. Yeah, from the chat, Emily asked if there's a recommendation on how to discover or build your own personal philosophy. Um, I actually do have some material. It's quite long winded. So what I'll do is I'll post it in this in this group. If you guys can just pick up on the chat later, I'll have to dig it up. It's a bit old. Um, and I've actually got a template that you can use to build out your philosophy. Um, but I do have some material that I'll share with the group. That's great. Thanks for that. And when I get the recording posted inside Tech Community for this call, we'll make sure to include those resource links as well. Beautiful. Fantastic. Well, if there are no more, any more questions, while you're thinking of your final questions, I will just end with a couple of notes of what's coming up on the agenda. So uh, next month's call in September is the 20, Thursday, the 26th of September. I'll actually be presenting from uh, Christchurch or Queenstown, one of the two. I think I'll still be in Christchurch, uh, back in my hometown actually of uh, Christchurch, New Zealand next month. So uh, what we will have next month is a guest speaker, Vanessa Love. Now, Vanessa Love loves to mentor and coach women to do public speaking, especially technical public speakers. And so I bumped into her at an event the other day where someone she had been coaching was speaking for the very first time at an event and she was super proud. So if you have thought about maybe whether public speaking or speaking at user groups or technical conferences is a thing for you, Vanessa has some amazing advice on 
why it's important to your career and how you can get started um, and some of the sort of preconceived ideas we kind of need to get over if, if we want to take a dip into that kind of space. Um, and also while I'm in New Zealand, uh, if we've got anybody in the call that is in Auckland, we're looking at putting together a Women in Tech event on Friday the 20th of September up at Microsoft Auckland, uh, probably for a 5.30pm kickoff. Um, just some networking and some nibbles and a bit of a chat uh, from me about my career in IT. We'll probably talk about burnout and mental health. Um, we haven't quite de decided the, the topic, so any feedback on that would be great. But looking to get some uh, women around Auckland, New Zealand, uh, together to actually meet in person on the 20th of September. So stay posted and I'll send more of those details when they're confirmed as well. Emily, you're in Auckland. That's amazing. It'd be great to see if you could make it too. So if anybody else wants to pop in any events, Susan's just mentioned that she's giving a Women in Tech talk on October the 11th to the Lawrence SharePoint user group. Um, fantastic. That's great to hear, Suzanne. Uh, good luck with that talk. Um, and if there's any other events, just drop them in the chat that we know of. And uh, with that, if there's no more questions. Uh, oh, great. Thanks, As The Girl Geek Sydney events, there's a link there for their upcoming meetup as well. So that's great to see. Um, any final closing comments, Colleen, before we close out this call? Um, I think just, you know, just be proud of who you are. You know, be your authentic self. Bring it, bring it to every part of what you do. And uh, yeah. And if you if you feel stuck, let me know. Fantastic. That's great. Look, I really appreciate your time today and, and the time that it would have taken you to put this material together. It obviously sounds like a topic that you very much speak to from the heart. So we, we thank you for sharing your stories and your advice with us today. And thank you, everybody, for joining on the call. If you know people that couldn't make it today, watch out on Tech Community where I will post a recording as soon as we can get that up and available. Or uh, maybe I think this it's probably a call that I'm going to come back to in the future when I'm feeling maybe a little bit of self-doubt. Um, I, I might need to come back and just remind myself about some of that amazing advice from Colleen. So thank you very much, everybody. We will see you on the call on Thursday, the 26th of September. Have an amazing month. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye. Colleen, bye.